Hey, Brie. Hey. So what's cracking? Are we starting a podcast or what? We're starting a podcast. But it's more than a podcast. First of all, thank you, Cole, so much for coming. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Cole is one of our dear friends, and we're super excited to have him on the pod for many reasons. So excited to have you. Um, so to give some background about Cole, Cole is a writer, author, political commentator, friend, brother, mentor, mentor foe to some. <laughs> <laughs> but so basically, Cole grew up, grew up in Philly. He went to Georgetown where he wrote his first book, Gray Boy. And since then, kind of the floodgates of writing and being an overall creative have opened for Cole. Most recently, it was announced in April that he is a selection of Steph Curry's underrated book club. And then now, his in 2021, it was announced that ABC announced the rights to develop a TV show based on Gray Boy. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Amazing. He also recently, to cross paths, wrote your ex booze book. Yeah. Matt James. Matt James. First impressions. First impressions. We did. Which co author on that. The yes, more I looked into this, the more I was like, this feels very fitting. So, Cole, let's start with your first book, Gray Boy. What's it about? What inspired you to write it? Um, so Grey Boy, as we were talking a second ago, Grey Boy is about growing up black in predominantly white spaces. Um, what inspired me to write it is I was, as you mentioned, a student at Georgetown, and I was in this class where he required us to write a really, really long essay um, about a business we wanted to start. And I basically went to him and said, if I'm going to write this many words, it should be about whatever I want it to be about. Um, mm. And I wanted to capture this experience that I had and I think in some ways we shared around um, growing up black in these predominantly white spaces. I went to a private school in Philadelphia. Um, so it's part memoir and it's part interviews with many friends and peers of mine um, trying to capture that experience of being kind of the only one uh, in a space. Mm -hmm. And how was the process of writing it? Um, it was a long one. So I, as I mentioned, I this started as an essay for a class and I wrote it basically that whole, I think I was a junior, I wrote it that whole first semester of junior year, um, signed to an agent the middle of my junior year, thinking mm. that I would publish it by the time I graduated. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just like not how things work often. Uh, so it ended up taking me four years from the time I started writing that essay until when I eventually published it. Um, wow. Four years, a couple agents living in different countries and taking different jobs. And then finally, um, four years later, I'd, I'd finished. Mm -hmm. And a lot of so this season on Yabo Who Cares is all about dating and relationships. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely like a tread line throughout Grey Boy. Yep. How was that process like? And who did you write about? Um, when you say that process, how is dating or how is writing about dating? What do you mean? Let's start with writing about dating okay. and then we could get into the details. Um, so I think that. I mean, there, there is a chapter specifically about dating in, in like my own experiences dating, mm -hmm. um, particularly dating across racial lines um, in the book. And um, it was particularly the case with that chapter. But I think with a lot of content in the book, um, you know, it's, I'm writing about people that I know personally often, whether it be about dating or my family and members or whatever else. And I that's always sensitive material to try to grab hold of. You know, that's mm -hmm. like I, you want to be. Uh, respectful and understand that these people that you sort of love and admire these people at the same time, you want to be honest. Um, so th particularly in the dating chapter, but uh, sort of the book writ large, uh, dealing with those issues was always a bit slippery. Um, and I think that the, the solution is just to try to be as honest as you can on the page uh, and worry about the rest later. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my approach to dating, but that was my approach to, you know, every other topic in the book. Mm -hmm. Can you give me give us an example of, you know, a relationship that you wrote about in Gray Boy and had to deal like what were the consequences of then the book publishing? Yeah. And obviously I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I realize this is supposed to be about dating. But when you ask me that question, the first relationship that comes to mind is my mom. Like, mm. you know, my I wrote um both about my mom. Also, there was a chapter in the book written by my mom that, mm. that sort of we worked on together. Um, and then I wrote about like really sensitive topics in my own life. And as you can imagine, 
um, you know, she learned about many of these topics for the first time reading her son's book. Yeah. Um, my mother didn't see drafts of the book. Like I showed her basically three and a half years into writing this thing. I showed her, um, you know, basically a, a nearly complete book. I, so when you talk about consequences, like that's, that's a good example where like yeah. I have no regrets around being as honest as I was about my dating life or about depression or about anything mm -hmm. else. Um, but we certainly had to have a lot of like really grown up conversations um, yeah. after the book, after she had read the book, uh, where I think she really struggled with some of the material in it. Mm. What material? I mean, particularly the depression chat, like there's mm -hmm. a, there's an entire chapter around, um, depression and, yeah. and frankly, like uh, sort of struggles that I've had and even attempts that I've made on my own life. And, um, as you can imagine, I think any mother, you know, harbors guilt and, and real struggles around, uh, discovering that about their child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was the nature of your relationship like with your mother before mm. you wrote the book and then now? Um, I mean, I spent you know, most basically all of high school in a, in a single parent household. Um, it was me, my mom, my sister, uh, I have a younger sister. Uh, so my mom and I, particularly when it became a single parent household, it went from, um, kind of mother's son to almost partners trying to kind of usher this ship, um, through choppy waters. Uh, so, so we've always been very close. Um, I think that every child and their parent you know, reaches an impasse where, where it's no longer child parent, you have to kind of look at each other as flawed adults. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that would have happened later in life, had this book not come out. Uh, but this mm -hmm. book was like, really, it really jump started that for us, mm -hmm. um, where I think we both had to kind of confront each other's shortcomings, uh, mm -hmm. all at once. Mm -hmm. I love how you said that. Yeah. And also like navigating choppy waters and becoming a partner with your parent. That's something most kids don't have to deal with you were a child at the time yeah and and i think that um you know without getting too far into it like divorce makes folks grow up particularly mm -hmm. first sons you know I, I i think that not that she placed this on me but i i felt um a certain amount of responsibility mm -hmm. uh, as the, you know the quote-unquote man of the house um and that's the effect that it has mm -hmm. yeah so you wrote about several relationships in the book yep um some of them were a lot longer some of them were uh, about like first first encounters and um obviously exploring ones like sexuality mm. what relationships did you write about and can you tell us like a little bit about each one uh yeah so there's a chapter in the book called the great ones um and and that chat the title of the chapter is taken from one of my favorite movies a bronx tale um, which is like a class, it's Robert De Niro's director directorial debut. And it's a classic like mob movie. Um, but it's also a love story and a coming of age story. And at one point, one of the mobsters says to this young kid, um, you have to go after this girl. She might be one of the great ones. You only get three great ones in your life. Uh, so basically don't miss this shot. Um, so I write about my three great ones in the book. Um, three different girls over the course of probably 10 years, maybe a little less. I already your three great ones. I'm, I'm tapped out. I'm done. Wow. According, according to, according to Sonny, the mobster in a Bronx tale, you've already had your three I, great I, I'm ones. I'm done. I'm out here. Wow. That's it. Wow. All right. Um, whether that is true or not, they are certainly, uh, great in their own right. Uh, and it, it kind of, I think you watch, it's interesting talking about me as like a character in the book. Uh, which is kind of how I treat it, particularly now that the book is kind of separate from me. Mm -hmm. And I think that hopefully over the course of the chapter, you watch the character of me go from what is um, puppy love, which is like r feels intense and real at the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those middle school, high school loves to uh, two different relationships in college with two very different people, um, mm -hmm. both of whom were very special and kind of in their own right as well. But you're, I think you watch the maturing of, uh, romantic relationships over the course of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I also really kind of want to take a step back too, because you said something really interesting earlier. You said that you were dating across racial yeah. lines. So can you just give us a little bit of overview of your dating history? Like yeah. how many like serious relationships have you been in? Yeah. And whenever you say dating across racial lines, what does that look like for you? Um, serious relationships, I guess, is a matter of perspective, but like, I would consider yeah. the emotions that I felt in all three of these situations quite serious. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, two of the girls were white. One is black, okay. um, have dated 
uh, you know, both black and white people throughout my life. Um, and I think that one of the reasons uh, of all of the chapters in this book, um, this one took the longest. I mean, this one, I, some of the chapters I only knew I was going to write, you know, kind of right before it came out. Um, the great ones I knew about and yet sort of wrote for an entire four years. And the reason it took so long was trying to navigate this very fine line around how black men talk about dating across racial lines. Um, and that's just a conversation that's really easy to fuck up. And, and I've seen it um, go wrong so many times. And um, I wanted to be as honest as I could and yet handle that very delicate situation delicately. Yeah. Why is it so easy to fuck up? Because I think that um, I, I guess how I often describe it is that like there there's these two kind of dueling impulses. Like on the one hand, um, you know, I, I grew up in a house of only black women, essentially, and and come from a family of incredibly strong black women. I mean, like mm-hmm. remarkably strong black women. And that's um, that's my mother and my sister and my grandmother. But that's also like the mini aunties and, you know, my mother's yeah. friends in my life. And um, so trying to communicate my love, admiration, affection, respect for these specific black women, but also black women writ large, um, at the same time as communicating um, my love, all of those same emotions for like a very specific white woman in a way that is not, um, most people will, will see those two qualities and and assume that they're like mutually exclusive or necessarily in conflict. Um, trying to communicate both of those things and hold those things at the same time is not an easy, uh, balance to strike. Um, and that's what I attempted to do. And that's why it just took so long. And when I say fuck up, I mean, like when you talk about consequences from stuff that I've written, like that is the chapter, Absolutely, you know, had, yeah. had I, had I written, you know, st- on other topics, I could mess it up. If I had messed that chapter up, um, that's where I would have heard from it, heard about it from, you know, mom and auntie and everybody else. Mm-hmm. I feel like, um, I had this conversation with my, with a business partner, actually mm. about black, uh, about interracial dating black woman dating white men, white men dating black woman, and then black men dating white woman. Mm -hmm. What are the archetypes in your perspective when it comes to interracial dating and how do the responses between the black community and the white community with you dating interracially differ? Um, So to the first question, I think that like archetypes is such a difficult like there are stereotypes, there are mm-hmm. stereotypes around the, around the black guy that chooses to date outside of his race. Um, I don't know that that stereotype of um, sort of whether it be as severe as self-hatred or as minor as kind of like a disinterest in mm-hmm. us. Um, I don't know that that stereotype rings true to my experience or the experience of many people that I know personally. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure that there's, I'm not sure that there's clear archetypes, but there are kind of like well-reasoned um fears and concerns around black mm-hmm. people, black men in particular dating outside of their race. And and that's really what I was trying to sh- struggle with in the book is that, um, you know, I don't think that that, that that concern is unwarranted, you know, like, like I, uh, and, and that li- that's laid bare in statistics, you know, like we, we are far more likely to date white women than our black female counterparts are. Um, so I think that those are well-reasoned concerns and trying, that's the dance I'm trying to dance is like trying to say, I understand the macro statistics. I understand the macro and political concerns here. Mm-hmm. And yet love is such an intimate individual choice that um, it's, it's difficult to grapple with both of those things saying like, how do I part- how am I participating in this greater narrative around um, sort of us not being worthy of love? Mm-hmm. At the same time, feeling very intense emotions for an individual that's sitting across from me. Okay. And so the first relationship that you talk about in Great Ones is with the um, with your white counterpart, yes. right? And so that was the first deep love you've had for someone. Mm-hmm. So what were the micro, the macro, whatever, statistics that informed that relationship <laughs> and... How did that one relationship kind of inform your, because it is kind of a decision of who you date to a degree, um, like who you fall in love with, maybe, maybe not, but who you go on initial dates with, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I write about this in the book, um, that, you know, there were, I think there were certainly pressures, particularly from family around, um, 
kind of why are you dating? Why are you interested in that white girl? Um, I think that one of the challenges there, though, is that, you know, I went to a school where our graduating class was probably boys and girls was probably, you know, just north of 100, um, of which black people are the drastic minority. So when you like, I, I understand kind of the broader concerns that one might have seeing their like young black child choosing to date a white girl at the same time, like it's not like we're dealing with a, a world of options here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, like when you're talking about the the black counterparts that you would be dating, mm-hmm. um, whether that's women dating men or made men dating women in that environment, mm-hmm. you're talking about like three or four individuals. Um, Literally. So I think that like the, it just felt like the, the concern and pressure was a bit outsized given like the actual stakes when you're talking about an environment where there's just, you know, we're not, we're not in the bigger world yet. You're reacting, please. Can we pound the gavel really <laughs> quickly, please? Because I don't know if you can relate to this. Mm-hmm. I feel like you can, mm-hmm. but the main question getting that I got growing up was why do you choose to date white men? Yeah. And I think that's like an obvious, um, misconception and in like a very flawed way to think given that the statistics are there are two black people right. two right. black people right. in my entire upper school yeah. of 400 people right. yeah so whenever you're whenever you ask like well i'm attracted to this it's because this is the majority right. of the people that right. i'm in and that i'm like choosing yeah. from yeah. Yeah. this is the dating pool yeah i mean I don't even know if there was a black guy in my college and my university that I can wow. like, think wow. of off wow. the top of my head. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah. And so from that standpoint, cause that is super important. I feel like as a black girl, I just, because I wanted to avoid all of those questions and maybe it was because I went to an all girls Catholic school. So there were no men. Right. It was kind of like, okay, let me just like actually just remove myself from dating altogether yeah. because it's like, who wants to have those questions when frankly, the same questions that white counterparts ask us, no one's asking them. No, yeah. mm-hmm. Like yeah. no one's questioning. What are, can we get specific about those questions? What questions do people ask you? I, I, so I'll, I'll answer that question, but I want to just quickly tag on to what you just said is that the, the chapter before the great ones, I think it's called letter to a friend. I almost once had or something. And it's, mm-hmm. and it's about um, a young girl who I really didn't know that well, but was, you know, when we were in middle school and I went to an all boys school that was directly across the street from an all girls school. Um, and suddenly like we become aware all at once that like there is this other sex that's walking around on that campus over there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was the black guy in my group of white friends. Um, and there was a young woman who was the black girl in our sort of counterpart Mm -hmm. group of, of white people. And, um, I remember distinctly, like when I was in middle school, just the broad assumption that like we were going to get married. You know, just like, like the broad assumption that like me and this young woman were going to just like walk into the sunset together. And, and I, and I write about it in the book because like, it wasn't even like we disliked it. It was truly like, we didn't know each other. Like there was no, you know, so I think that you're right that like, when we're trying to figure, there's all this like awkward grappling around this topic because it was just, it was just nonsensical. Like the only basis for that pairing Mm -hmm. was the fact that we were the same race. Um, which and it's always that it's always like oh you always. two should be i remember when i read that chapter or that like part of the chapter the also the letter i think you wrote whatever it was i had that same exact experience with a guy who i re- remember when you like would facetime on those like apps with people yeah, yeah. and i remember there was the black guy in the group and i was so excited because i was like yeah like he would be interested in me. Like, why wouldn't he be? Like, I'm funny. And then he was like, oh, what's your friend's name? And then I was Damn. like, suddenly it Damn. was like, oh, sh- I'm not like, no, this is not going to work out. But I really, that part yeah. really resonated with me. Yeah. Well, and I think going, we'll get to that question a little bit. Cause I do mm-hmm. think it's important to t- like, to speak out loud what those questions look like. But even in where you mention where you've talked about like, not feeling level lovable or not being like as desired I felt that a lot growing up was maybe like I was never desired by the three black boys Mm. in my class like Mm. I was never desired by the black guys that I would experience that I would come into 
contact with growing up, which I guess kind of hit like maybe subconsciously I started telling myself like, okay, well, I'm just not desired by black men because the one black guy didn't like the one black girl and that's okay. But that doesn't mean that like, it doesn't mean that you're desired any less or, I mean, I think it's important to, it's important to bring the issues together. Like black men and black women both feel those pressures and probably feel the same way. But back to the questions of what, can I, can yeah. I jump in? I'm yes. sorry to yes. keep no, cutting yeah. you no, off this before that. This is good. Because, because I think that, and, and I, when I, the chapter that I just referenced a letter to a friend I once had, it was actually, it's actually an apology letter. Um, mm-hmm. And what it is, is basically when people are kind of pushing us together, I, as a sixth, seventh grade boy, you know, my reaction to that was disrespectful in retrospect. You know, my reaction to that is like, ew, no. Not again, not as a reaction to her so much as right. it is like there's there's this clear like framework and lens that they're looking at us through that I'm uncomfortable with. Right. And and in the letter itself is an apology saying like, look, I didn't realize kind of the bigger game that was being played here that I was playing into. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say I do think that like it's drastically different black men and black women in that environment. Like I yeah. do think that you know, through sports and through hypersexualization of black men and through all of these other things, like we are able to, I, I look at my sister and she had a very different experience than I did. Yeah. Like, I think that we're able to gain a foothold that is largely unavailable to our female counterparts. Um, so I don't mean to suggest that it's identical, right? but only yep. that um, some of those same themes around struggling with um, sort of self Im- image and my own perception of my own beauty Um, that does sort of cut across, you know, Mm -hmm. both genders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a TV show I watched and it was actually, um, it was an Asian girl that was talking about it, but it was like, she was starting crying because her cool friend came and everyone loved her because she was Asian. And she was like, why? And this is the same thing. Like, why does blackness look so much cooler on black men in uh, private school settings yeah. and whatever predominantly white settings, but it doesn't look cool on me. And that's kind of this, the thread line that mm-hmm. I felt. It mm-hmm. was like, oh, the black guy gets all of the girls of any race is in yeah. the star athlete of the whatever it's called. All the teachers love them. They get the star treatment, yeah. whatever, which is not always the case. And for black men that don't fit in the archetype, it's like, oh, well then what, who am I? Right. But for the black girl, it's like, literally i i want nothing to do with you yeah Yeah. because you're not desired by society and my friends and i'm not going to desire you either and and like i i certainly don't mean to suggest that they are equally um damaging but i do think that it is like like the same impulse pushing in opposite directions like it is it is a white majority um looking at us through stereotypes that exist about us so you know yeah. like not seeing the person and seeing um whether it be hyper athletic hyper masculine mm-hmm. black man um or sort of unappealing perhaps aggressive perhaps whatever else black woman it's those sa- it's that same lens it just mm-hmm. happens in that power structure it happens to be pushing us in opposite directions if yeah. that makes sense yeah 100 yeah. um so how did because of that and because of the people that you went to school with, some yeah. of them were black, some of them were white, some of them were from um, different environments of your life. How were their responses to you having that conversation, specifically the white people that you interacted with, but like you didn't speak about race with? Like their responses to the book? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I've been asked that question. I think I struggle with it. Like, in some sense, like you'd have to be a pretty bold dude to like hit me up and say, yo, I hated your book. So like to the, to the extent that that's true to the extent that that response existed, I'm not sure like I'd be the best barometer of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I did have like very specific conversations. I mentioned the one with my mother, but, um, sort of also people that I've dated in the past people in my community. And I think that, um, the hardest of those conversations are around people that felt, uh, in some way betrayed by how I had written about our community. You know, I grew up in a pretty tight knit, um, pretty close kind of bubble uh, in Philly. And the the most difficult of those conversations are people that kind of say like, I, I can't believe you would say that about us or write that about us, or that's not how I perceive myself. Why do you perceive me that way? Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think that's the most difficult. I think the the positive way that that conversation often happens is instead, you know, I had no idea you were experiencing this same world in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for enlightening me that this is how these same hallways that we both walked through Mm -hmm. were viewed from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, So it happens kind of both ways, but in the, in the worst iteration of it, um, people have been a bit offended, I think. Mm -hmm. The, and even talking about offending others and we'll move on to the next topic, but in the first opening of the book, you talk about um, being in somewhere in the Bahamas, right? And this black woman, She's beautiful and she's very much being a black woman in a space that is very wealthy, white, whatever. Yep. And you, she sits down and then she, her partner is white. And so you kind of talk about how that you felt betrayed by that instance. Yep. And then now you're talking about how you kind of betrayed others by dating white woman. How do you navigate like, kind of the um being it's ironic that you can feel hurt when people of your own race date Mm -hmm. white people but Mm -hmm. like oh i can do it though yeah i mean what like like we can call that what it is like it's contradictions like it's clearly contradictory and Mm -hmm. and i think that in that chapter it was in part I think that the real moment was was less her white partner but then she ended up having blonde hair and like even that is like such an absurd thing. I guess the context around that chapter is necessary. Like, like I'm on this Island in the Bahamas that is very small. Um, that is really a retreat for incredibly wealthy, often Manhattanites. Um, and as a result of it being so small, like I am literally the only black tourist on this Island. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's no white service people. So what that means is that like everyone that is there vacationing is white, except for me. Mm -hmm. And everyone that is there working is black. Um, and then I see this this woman who uh, who is the only other black tourist. And like in a time that is incredibly disorienting, I'm looking to her to kind of tether me to reality. Like, yeah, I just don't know where to place myself. You know, you're walking around these massive mansions and like there's all this colonial yeah. artwork. And you're like, I, you know, in this image, I am not the guy coming in on the ship. Like, right. You know, like right. like in so struggling with that. And I think that um, what I tried to get across with that piece was that like she didn't I was hoping that there would be some recognition like Mm -hmm. you know like when you're out and about and you say hey sis it's good to see you like that just that Mm -hmm. you know that is that is like all I needed and the fact that we didn't share that I think was was disorienting not that I blame her for it but it was just like it was just I was trying to wade through and sift through those emotions um but to your point like yeah it's contradictory like like I think that I mean, I'm interested in your guys' view on this because I, you have both dated across racial lines as well. So, like, yeah, how do you process the fact that, you know, perhaps you can uh, judge might be too strong a word, but I'll use it, judge black men that date white women and yet date white men? It's I, I think it depends on how both people position themselves in yeah. it. So, like, I think in society, the men that you see get canceled for dating white women are men that are like central to black culture. Mm. So it's like, oh, you're central to black culture. You're a black black icon. You're in black TV shows. You're in black movies. But why are you not actually doing that in your personal life? Right. Whereas I think that sadly, when you see it, both, and this is both sides, this is gender agnostic. When you see a black person date a non- black person and they kind of reject their blackness and they're not really a part of black culture. And obviously black culture is not something tangible. It's our own experiences, blah, 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 blah. But in the very, in the traditional sense, it's like, Oh, I understand that a little bit more. And I can see that as why that person made that choice. And then that's why for me, when I'm dating, it's like as someone who is, has dated all races and is really a an activist i would say how does that make me look and why and i'm questioning myself and like why am i attracted to different people or like want to be a part of a different and i have to really think about why that's happening in my own 
yeah. life. Mm-hmm. And that, that, I mean, that is a burden that's like uniquely ours, right? Like, it's, right. you know, uh, the fact that, that a choice as personal and intimate as it gets, like who will be your partner, mm-hmm. um, is also political in nature for mm-hmm. us. Um, you know, that's, that's a uniquely black burden. And I think in some ways an unfortunate one, but not one without sort of justified roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And it goes for all, right? Like it goes for religion too. Right. And like yeah. other religions yeah. deal with this. Other races that aren't yeah. black people deal with this. And I guess the only people that don't have to deal with this are when, I don't know, who? I mean, white folk? Is that, is that, <laughs> is that, the, is that not the Is that what you wanted to answer? say? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know. But I also, I, I would never understand the perspective of a, me, obviously, as a white person, period. But me as a white person dating a non-white person and like kind of, and Rachel t- touched on that on her podcast yep. episode of yeah. how it feels to walk through life dating a black person but also dating a black person and going through a controversy right. where you're publicly canceled yeah. Yeah. and yeah. how that feels. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel? So, so you, gray boy was published during the height of the BLM movement in yeah. 2020. You were living in California. Um, many of the um, p- networks and publications asked to talk to you about the issue from an American perspective. And uh, obviously in Australia, they have a totally different history when it comes to race. Um, and similarly, ABC kind of looked as Matt James as their response to the BLM yeah. movement, which maybe like we're pulling out straws here in terms of figuring out the correlation. How did it feel having to answer those massive questions for a big audience that are not quite familiar with the American yeah. history when it comes to race? Yeah. Um, so I was living in Australia, uh, in Sydney, Australia. And um, I think I actually don't think that you're kind of pulling it at straws here. I mean, uh, Matt and I throughout that time had, had conversations around how we were, I think going through similar things, obviously mm-hmm. on two drastically different stages, but, um, but going through similar things. So the, the context here is that, um, George Floyd is murdered and I, uh, wrote an opinion piece for the Sydney morning Herald at that time. Uh, gray boy was about two and a half months from publication. I don't think I had ever written anything for, a publication before the Sydney Morning Herald is kind of the New York Times of Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't think I had ever been on TV before either. And, you know, I was in a market where in Australia, I think the black population is like 1.5%. Um, the b- majority of whom are African immigrants. When you use the word black in Australia, you're not referring to sort of African descendants, you're referring to indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Um, so really like a minuscule population. And suddenly, I'm in this market that has like a sudden thirst to understand, you know, the black predicament in America. Um, And I kind of entered that in some ways unwittingly, you know, I released this piece. I am therefore asked to be on the radio. And then very quickly it goes from, you know, I've never done any of this to I'm on the nightly news several times a week and and covering Trump's election and all this other stuff. And um, I do think that it was uh, taxing in a lot of ways. I mean, like my, clearly defined role in that media market was to give voice to uh, black suffering and trauma and to help unpack that. And I think that it's an important job, but it's not like a lighthearted job. You know, no. it's, it's a job that like, uh, you know, when at, at the height of that, when I was really, you know, going on air quite a bit, it was not uncommon to be sitting at a cafe and someone come over and say, you know, oh, what do you think of that last black person that got shot and killed? I mean, like, you know, probably in more delicate terms than that, but like, <laughs> no, you know, I think like, that's pretty spot on. But, you know, that was not an uncommon event at one point. Um, so I, I ended up spending a year in Sydney. And at the end of that year, I think I was at kind of a crossroads where I could decide to, you know, try to lay roots here and really build a career here. And I think I would have just struggled too much with that piece of it. Uh, the fact that like, I am so clearly the designated voice for this community that is voiceless in that market. Um, not to, put outsized importance on it but it was I mean that was my role uh and eventually it became taxing no easy feat Hmm. no easy feat what do you wish that people knew about that like if you could give context to that situation for let's say white Americans and also then black Americans like what did you want people to know like the racial situation in Australia um I mean, it's a very different place. It's weird because Australia in some ways, um, one is as far as you can get basically from America. 
and yet culturally is about as close as you can get. I mean, right. it's weird that like you, you end up, you know, traveling, whatever it is, 20 hours. And if, if I were to drop you in Sydney, you would be able to function. It's not like I'm dropping you in Beijing, you know, like right. you, you would understand how this place works. Um, and yet you spend enough time there and the subtleties start to scream at you. Like the fact that there are just no black people. I mean, it's weird being in an urban environment. I write this in, in my first piece, I think it was for the Sydney Morning Herald, where my first five days in Melbourne, I didn't see a black person for the first five days I was in Melbourne. Like it was like, and it's weird being in a truly urban environment where there are big buildings and 7-Elevens and like all of this other stuff yeah. that connotes diversity. Mm -hmm. And yet there's none of it. Um, at the same time, all of the subtleties of racism that you're used to here, you know, the cab passing you on the street, the woman at the nice fancy store not asking you, can you be helped? None of that existed either. Um, so it was really like, you have to really be immersed in it to pick up on those subtle differences, but they are there. Mm -hmm. hmm. I feel like microaggressions in, it's, it's really funny traveling and understanding what microaggressions change in different yeah. environments. And then which ones like you were touching on, like, are the same, right. like no matter where you go. Right. And I feel like it kind of goes back to, and not to talk about dating again, but like the microaggressions you heard in dating where like you go on a first date with someone who's black or white or white or a non-black person. And you're like, oh, I'm waiting for this comment to come. Right. And I know what my yeah. response is going to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also not even just exclusive to dating. Like it's just, you know, it's relationships in general. Yeah. I yeah. feel and like. job and yeah. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's just relationships in general and navigating those conversations, I think, as black men and black women. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. It, you're just waiting. Like when is it going to come up yeah. or the come out? The one that that for me that I've dealt with a lot lately is is and it's actually like I want to like write about this or something because it's so funny to me is I'm now I'm now working in media full time so I'm I'm writing other stuff and I'm now doing some film and TV stuff and um, when meeting people particularly in groups of white people that um, and sort of introducing the work that I do they um, they immediately jump to like I should I should make a list of like them immediately jumping to whatever the last black movie they saw was, even if that black movie came out in like, you know, like even if they're like, oh my God, what do you think of Stomp the Yard? You know, like like, like whatever the, Nothing like the whatever their touch point is, which is so fun. Like I want to make a list of like, it's so funny to me because like, there should be like, a formula maybe. You know, I can't. Like, of like figuring like, out what movie is this like, person going to say. You know, like, like we can relate on, you know, Manchester by the sea if you want. Like, like, you know, like yeah. we can talk about. You don't gotta pull out thirteenth. Like, I know that you with the, I know that you for the cause. You know what I'm saying? So like that, but somewhat off topic. But like that no, is the one not. that I've been that I've been negotiating quite a bit lately. So closing the book on Grey Boy, yeah. um, and moving on to our our next segment, which we've kind of already bled into. Um, is there anything that you left out of Grey Boy that you would add or what do you think when you reflect on your choices um, and decisions of what to include and not include in the book? Um, I don't think there's anything that I left out that I would add. You know, Grey Boy, like I said, has it took several years. So in some ways, um, like the character of Cole throughout the book matures in part because like it's happening in real time you know like some of the dating relationships for instance like had not reached their conclusion mm -hmm. um well within the time i was writing the book um i tried really hard to be like as honest as i could be on those pages and mm -hmm. so if anything i think i over indexed for that like i like yeah. i felt i feel really good particularly like the most difficult stuff was the stuff around depression and and i feel good about my choices to include a lot of that um because so many of the conversations I have now, particularly with younger kids, uh, that's important to them, you know, like yeah. to see themselves reflected in that way. Um, so I have no, I have no regrets whatsoever as relates to that. But because I was writing as I was growing, I also know that like the book must end and yet I am continuing to mature and mm -hmm. which is not to say there's another book, but like hopefully there are other, there's other stuff over here that probably yeah. could have fit into that narrative. Um, yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, so I know we did touch on, we did touch on this, you know, you working with Matt on, on first impressions. Does any of your personal experience 
come into the play of Matt's experience? Did it help yeah. that you and Matt had maybe similar experiences growing up that you guys could be, you know, or you could be a sounding board for him? Like, did any yeah. of your experiences play into his book? So, um, or whenever you're writing yeah. books on this specific topic, whether it's like life, being black, dating, relationships, whatever it is. So I think that uh, important context on how that came about, I was still living in Australia at the time and Grey Boy, I think at that point was out, but no, 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 Grey Boy wasn't even out yet. I'd finished writing it. Um, He was on his season of The Bachelor and I get a call from Matt and like, we're talking about something totally different. And Mm -hmm. then literally as I'm about to hang up the phone, he's like, oh, by the way, I got a book deal. I need a co-author. Like, you want to do it? I had never co-written anything, you know, like I had never, and that's to his credit because I think it shows kind of his trust in me as both a friend and a creator. So I I really appreciated that. Um, Your question was whether my experience comes into it. I think that in real time, I was trying to understand how to navigate those, Mm. those different roles because it is different when you're like, when you know, not only do you know the person, like, you know, a lot of the people surrounding that person. Yeah. Um, So you know, if I have a conversation with you, Brie, I need to be circumspect about whether I let that bleed into this narrative because it's yeah. not my job to tell um, sort of your version of events. You right. know, it's not my it's my job to to help tell help Matt tell his story. Right. Um. So I think that I did at times wrestle with that a bit. Um. Where I think that my experience was helpful though was that there are certain questions that I would know to ask Matt that, Mm. you know, so much of this is pulling stuff out of people. And, and there are certain questions that I would know to ask Matt that I don't think the next, you know, 50 year old white ghost writer might, um, you know, and, and that's in part because of my familiarity with him, but also in part because, you know, I, I am him in some ways, um, and, and can help with that. Yeah. It's like get out. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. Wait. Yeah. You are him. Oh, you. there you go. <laughs> um, so you are obviously Mr. It now. Um, obviously. Obviously. Who is that obviously. obviously. Uh, no one I know, but I think <laughs> okay. people yeah. tell me that. Um, <laughs> so you're obviously a public persona. Um, how has your dating life shifted since you've taken on a more public persona? And is it weird that any woman that you could date could listen to this podcast, read your book, Really understand yeah. the intimate, personal details of what it's like to date Cole. So I, I was actually going to uh, say this earlier, but now I I was deciding, but now I will say this. So I went on, this is in some ways answering your question. Um, I was living in Australia. I think I was like maybe a couple months away from moving back to the States and connected with somebody on an app, went on this app date and we meet at the bar She's like a very kind of type A, go, go, go. She, I can't remember, but she had some very impressive job. And, and um, it was clear early on that this was, that there was no future here, but she was lovely and like we could chat. Um, so we talked for maybe, <laughs> we talked for maybe an hour and a half or two hours or something. And I, and at this point she's had a couple margaritas and she's like, oh, okay, like I'm just going to say it. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, what, what are you just going to say? I mean, you've been telling me all this stuff all that, you know, for the last two hours. And I had to just tell you, I listened to your entire book today and I've already known all of this. And I'm like, yo. Wow. Like, first of all, like, like one kind of weird that you spent six hours yeah. of your day doing that. No, to it's not. It's more the whole weird. Book? No, it's not. You put weird. it out for people to read and, yeah, and listen to. to. She's supporting you. Day. It's not weird, but, then, but it's, weird it's weird to, to not sit through an entire right. date and right. be like, "Oh my right. god!" By the way, yes. you're being very, very repetitive right no, now. No, no, right. like and, that part's okay. weird. Okay, okay, okay. You don't think it's, so? You would. Ha, ha, it's not weird that she spent six hours listening to your book, but it's weird that the fact that she went on a date with you and didn't bring it up. Hey. Some people like to read. Okay. You should be glad that she was. No, she there literally to gave you money. You. Also, no, I don't think it's weird for her to say it. Like, if I go on a date with a guy, but and not I'm in Instagram the beginning and, and the Facebook end? stalking him, and I'm like, he's like, oh my aunt, and I'm like, oh yeah, Aunt Gerald, you went she, on the date. No, 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 no. She should have said it beforehand, or had the yes. social like yes. to not the say social knowledge to not yeah, say yeah, it yeah, at exactly. all. Yeah, yeah. After two hours, I've been sitting here telling you about my mom and my sister, and like, you already know her name. You know where she lives. You know, like, yeah. 
Yeah, no, she should not have said stuff. that. She shouldn't have said like, that. It was it was a it was a trippy moment for me. Um <laughs> So in some like that is the starkest example of the question that you just asked. Yeah. I don't have any other examples of that. I do think that like, um, is it weird? It's it's a yeah, it's a bit weird. At the same time, like because I spilled so much of myself into that, um, it feels as though a burden is lifted as well. Like mm. the fact that you, the fact that you could read this thing, whether whether you choose to or not, the fact that it is public knowledge mm-hmm. means that I can enter every interaction with some degree of um openness that i possibly couldn't have before because i know that like all of this stuff i was carrying around um is out there Mm -hmm. if you want to consume it Mm -hmm. what do you what's your preference like whenever you meet someone on the street do you let going into conversations assuming that this person has no clue who you are or do you like going into conversations with women who you're totally like you're actually totally comfortable knowing that they may have may know who you are may know some of your experiences y- y'all are giving me like vastly more credit than i deserve like i am not famous like i no, like, n- i am not even a d-list celebrity so i go into every <laughs> okay, interaction well, you're f or d I, and i feel I, like that's pretty I, high then i go into every interaction <laughs> assuming that you don't know who to. F- I go over in, into every interaction hoping that like my breath don't stink. Like, was we it, were was it, that was a trick like, question. Not, this is what you were supposed you know, to say. <laughs> like, like I'm not, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not like wearing a hat and glasses outside hoping that like people don't recognize me. So like, I I, I do, you know. Well, every listen, I, I mean, I asked that question because let's say you do date someone yeah. who doesn't know who the you are. Right. They, I mean, not that they don't care; they could care less, but you do have a piece of you it's a memoir yeah. and i'm i'm this is my first time actually like hearing you say like this is a part of me yeah. that's out there yeah so it's almost like do you ex like do you go through and do you explain that is that supposed to come out in you like yeah. it is a big piece of who you are would it be nice for someone to read it like yeah i um I, I never like, I'm, I'm never like, Hey, here's my book. You right, know, like if you want right. to, you know, if you want to learn more about me, you know, you can start with chapter one. Um, yeah. but I, and now I'm in real time kind of trying to reflect on recent conversations I've had. I guess I'm, I, I don't volunteer. I mean, who does? I don't volunteer like mm-hmm. my deepest, darkest secrets, yeah. but, but most of them are on the pages. So, um, what if we end up there, what will end up happening is, is like, you know, we'll, I'll get to know somebody and then on the, upon their own volition, they will choose to, to go read this thing. Um, um, inevitably, that person ends up learning a lot about me in the pages that I wouldn't have just volunteered. Um, but what I think has changed in me is that I now, because that has happened with family members, with friends, with, you know, whatever, or with dating partners, um, I now have the, the faculties to, to speak to those topics in a way that I just never would have because i never mm. had to and, and openly avoided doing so right um so i'm not i'm just much i'm still uncomfortable but much more comfortable with yeah. those topics than i would have otherwise been i'd be scared to go on a date with you why do you say that because what if what if i get what if you end up in, in your a book? next book that yeah i feel like that's something that you have that you inevitably will have to take on if you're dating a writer or even a public person like or any public singer. Any any person in I media would want that's someone to write a, a, a song about me. Like, what if you're, you know, a dating a dating influencer who talks about her yeah. first oh, yeah, yeah. fifty oh, awful about. dates? Like, yeah, your yeah. Shit is gonna be put on blast. Yeah, that I, that I think about. Like, I like uh, you know, I don't listen to a lot of like the dating podcasts and stuff, but except for this one, listen <laughs> wherever podcasts are distributed. This is um, a dis. Okay, but, whatever. Yeah, but I I. I've met a few of those folks in life and I've actually had that exact same thought. We're like, man, I better be on my P's and Q's because what I don't want yes. is to end up in that next episode. I, um, I will say for my like personal creative output, like I feel as though my story was in many ways told in that book and mm. I'm just working on all this other stuff that, um, I mean, every, I think every creation you, you pull from your own experience, but not in the direct way that I, that I was in that book. So like yeah. I'm working on a novel right now where like, I don't think anybody will, there are certainly people I know in there, but I don't think anybody will read it and think, oh, that's me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, so, post-Grey Boy. Yes. 
life. Um, what does your day-to-day look like now? How do you structure your life given the fact you don't have a boss? A I, boss. <laughs> At first I was like, oh, what? <laughs> I don't uh, know. A, wait, let me read. Because I, a boss. A boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like a boss. <laughs> um, I... Structure is a funny word. Like I'm not sure it applies to to my life right now. I um, I'm working on a bunch of stuff. Uh, working on two books. Working on a, a docu series right now. And um, those projects when you have kind of multiple uh, projects on the burners at different times, like they heat up and and cool down uh, whenever they want to, not due to any schedule that you apply to them. Um, so my weeks look drastically different from each other. I travel constantly. I in a perfect world, particularly when I'm on deadline, the way my days look is wake up, write, go to sleep. Uh, and like when I was working on Matt's book, for instance, you know, it was it was us talking and it was us creating, you know, straight through. Um, now I'm, I'm much more kind of varied, uh, but I get in, you know, I try to get in writing every day. Not I try to, I, I write just about every day. Wow. Um, when you think about your personal brand, what are the five words that you would use to describe you? Um, I don't think about my personal, I, <laughs> le, le, uh, I want, okay, I'm, I'm going to reject the prep. Like I, I'm not going to give you five words, but I will say that what's important to me is, um, I want everything that I create to clearly on the page, be sort of thought out, insightful stuff. I want to, if I'm entering a conversation, I want to add something to that conversation. Um, so I, I want, I want someone to associate me with insight and with reason um and hopefully with some degree of uh principle um and if there's a final word i guess i am kind of giving you words so if there's a final word it's that like my my biggest job with gray boy was to put something honest on the page like i wanted this to be the truth as i saw it and um i want all of my creative work to be uh honest uh, and that's that's kind of like and that sounds simple, but when you're, when you're dealing with people with competing interests and you're dealing with, oh, will I offend this person? And, oh, will I, you know, is this sellable? And, I mean, all of this other stuff, um, one of the most difficult things to maintain is honesty. And I really want my work to be honest. Hmm. Wow. That's really deep. I love that. Do you feel like others try to pigeonhole you or tokenize you as someone who can speak to the Black experience after having now written Great Boy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I, you know, it's, it's challenging, like particularly after the events of 2020 and George Floyd's murder and like, there was a whole industry around speaking to race and blackness and diversity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like people rushed into like, you know, there's just like money floating in the air. If you could be this person that has something to say about being black in America, Mm -hmm. um, that's not really how I want to create or live my life like I, yeah. I I want to um I have a broad range of interests and and to the extent that my voice um contributes something I want it to contribute upon each of those interests not just like this one little thing that people perceive me to be you know somewhat an expert on um so I do feel like it happens but the way that I push against that is just like writing whatever I want right uh, you know like I, the, the reason that I you know I kind of stumbled into writing but the reason that it's a special endeavor is that like, like, like Seth said, I don't have a bouse. Like <laughs> I can, I, you know, I, all I need to write is some space in my computer. You know, I'm not an actor who needs to be hired. I'm not a director who needs equipment. Like I, like all I need is a word document. And, and I think there's something really special about um, being able to go away and just do this thing and not ask any money permission for it. Um, and for that reason, you know, no one can kind of control what I ultimately do. How do you feel like where you're going, where you've been in the last couple of years since the publishing of Grey Boy and where you're going, how do you feel like, has it changed any of your relationships between family, friends, romantic? Um, Is it something that you... Let me think about that. I... Yeah, I, I think it has in some ways. I think that when it comes to my family, it's all the stuff I've already mentioned. Like, yeah. I also, we, I didn't mention this, but I come from an Ethiopian family um, that's largely quite conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I come from this massive family, you know, like one of these Ethiopian families that has, you know, a million cousins. And <laughs> um, 
when each of them have read it, you know, like they're really learning a lot, you know, like, yeah. like particularly because I'm in, depending on how you count the eldest cousin, like I, in so many ways was like this golden boy to in the, in the eyes of these aunts and uncles. And, um, they're really confronting, um, you know, a, a redefinition of me. So I think that there has been some changes in many of those relationships in terms of, um, friendships i think that in i'll be interested if you guys are negotiating this as well um when you no longer are an employee somewhere when you're like trying to do your own thing at our age and you're like turning that corner um you begin to blur the line between like friendships and business partners you know like mm -hmm. i have all these other friends that are doing these cool and interesting things and um and i need help you know yeah. like I, like i no one you know no man is an island like i, I need uh -huh. help to get where i'm going and and they need help to get where they're going. And I think that um, I have had awkward encounters where we're trying to kind of awkwardly grapple with like, is this usury or does he really like me? And does that mm. matter if we're friend, you know, if we're, mm -hmm. if we're just going to get this thing done. And like, I think that like asking for help is something that I'm still wrestling with how to do the right way without, yeah. without people feeling some type of way. Yeah. Do well, you guys have that? Or not really. Yeah, very much so. I think I definitely think so. But I think at the end of the day, it's just being extremely transparent. Like yeah. I obviously, you know, I have friends who are also very um, we're friends, but it like uh, to some point, it sometimes there are things that feel like, oh, this is this feels an advantageous for you, right? right? Like it feels like, you know, we're friends because of my connection right. to so-and-so. Right. So it's like, now how can that benefit you? Um, but here's the thing is I think whenever you just approach that from a very honest and transparent, yeah. like humbling place, then, you know, let's all be honest here. I think we all want to yeah. have that. I think we all want to be able to nav like have friendships that can turn into business relationships. And it's just being like very honest and upfront about what it is that you, that you want. Like, it's like, yeah, yeah I love you, but I'm also like, I really fucking admire that you're working with so-and-so. Right. And like, I'd really right. like to work with them. If, it, if right. an opportunity comes up for you to, you know, throw my name in the conversation or ask if they're open to chatting with me, like, please do that. Right. And I think there are certain ways to go about that. And it's like, it's really hard to navigate if people don't know how to do that or no. aren't approaching it from an honest and transparent place. Yeah. I have a nine to five, so I could not benefit from either of you. <laughs> you, and you guys a are just here because I love you <laughs> both and I don't want anything from either of you. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, who do you admire and where do you think you'll be when you retire? Which you won't be. Well, you won't. Um, jeez. Uh, okay, who do I admire? That's a long list. Um, you know, besides the obvious, like the people I hold up in my family, um, I admire the both of you and, and many of my other friends that are no. um, doing, you know, like bright and wondrous yeah. things. Like I think that, I think that we're fortunate. I think I'm really fortunate to to have found myself surrounded by people that are um, that are just excelling at whatever it is that they do and I you know part it like lights a fire under my ass you know like I, I I know that I can't fail because the next five people next to me aren't gonna fail and and I want to keep up um in a healthy way not in like yeah. a competitive way um and then I'm trying to I really want to I don't think I'm gonna be writing books forever but like I I really want to get good at this craft you know like I want at least one or two more shots at um producing what I really think I'm capable of and gray boy isn't that like I you know I'm happy for what it did for me but I I don't I never go back to that thing because the few times I do I'm just like embarrassed by what's on the page um hmm. I think that my craft has developed since then yeah. and um in that respect I you know I really admire people that have mastered this craft you know Baldwin and Whitehead and Coates and so many others who like are heroes to me because I, you, you read what they're doing on the page. And once you understand how this craft works, you're like, man, that looks easy, but this is, you know, this is decades and decades of investment. Um, wow. so trying to, so, so I, I admire those who have done yeah. that. Nicole Hannah Jones, so many others. Okay. FMK, mm. Raya, Hinge, okay. Instagram DM. Um, Ooh, that's man, a good one. I, I, I don't Instagram DM like pretty much 
across the board. So okay, I, but I what if it was someone who DM. slid in with like a million followers and she was hot? Oh, she slid in mine? Yeah. Actually, I, another tangent, and then I will answer this question. I <laughs> I would go on, so I, I got a blue check when I was still living in Australia, which like in my mind, like they come to your house, drop off a million dollars, all of a sudden, you know, Instagram models are flying at you left and right. That's what I thought happened when you get a blue it's check. It's actually quite the opposite, it but is, it is interesting. I get a blue check and then start going on Australian TV and I would get off Australian TV positive that they were just going to be flooding my DMs. If I had a thousand DMs, it was a thousand gay men. <laughs> happened to me every time I went on TV. Honey, love your cheekbones. And I'm like, thank you, brother. Yes, honey. He yes, does have brother. some good cheekbones. So, like, just for diversity's sake, I would love, um, you know, what you're describing to happen to me. It's never happened to me. Uh, so, I, F, Raya, Mary, what was the other one? Hinge. Kill K, Instagram, Instagram DMs. DMs. Just wow. for, like, in terms of my own experience. Wow. wow. That's not Have you ever tried answer. to, like... Go into Slide someone's into DMs. yeah. I wouldn't even know how to approach that. Like, you I, literally like, I just no start with the high. I think it's okay, a subliminal works. thought at first. Send the subliminal thought. No, don't even establish anything. Okay. Like something. Okay. <laughs> and then maybe like respond to their stories and say something interesting that will spark a conversation. Okay. Well, we'll that's this afterwards. all impossible, but I'll help you out afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Offline. <laughs> Offline. Is there any other on FMKs we can do? No, that was such a good one. I was going to do an FMK for your favorite books. Oh, yeah. I don't oh. know your favorite books. Um, okay. I have to think about this, but I can, I can give them to you. Um, M. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson uh, did The Warmth of Other Suns. She also did Cast, which uh, was recently quite famous. But mm -hmm. in my opinion, her best book ever is The Warmth of Other Suns. Amazing. Um, a really beautiful book. Um, FMK is hard in this context because I'll just give you like my favorites. Wait, um, you should do FMK of your books. Um, Gray oh, Boy, First that. Impressions, and... And my new, and the one that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's God. perfect. I can't, Go. like... I, lo I love Ma I love Matt to death. Like, let me speak right into the let me speak right into the mic for this one. Matt is my brother. I love him. Um, so therefore, he will not be offended by what you say next. It is it is it's different when you co-author somebody else's story. Of so course. Like, so like for that reason, because it is not mine, it is his, and I was just a, a helping hand. Um, K, Matt's book. Um, uh, Mary, what I'm what I'm writing right now, which is how you should always feel, and F, uh, Gray Boy. Mm. So. On that note, thank you so much for coming. This was fun, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Are we the best podcast you've ever been on? It's certainly all day. This is the best one today. I've been in today. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Yeah, But Who Cares? We care a lot about what you think. And actually, your reviews really help us out. So please like, subscribe, follow or comment and leave a review. Even if it's negative, we want to improve. And I'd like to give a big fat disclaimer. We are not professionals. We are not therapists. We are not financial professionals. So please seek out professional help. Um... And this podcast was produced with our friends over at Yeah, But Who Cares, including our trusty producer, Serena. Serena. Um, it was also produced in partnership with Under the Influence. Shout out Under the Influence. Shout out Under the Influence. Where can people find us? If you want to find us, you can find us on our personal pages, Bree Springs and Sasana. Yes. But more importantly, you can find Yabba Who Cares on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. Did I miss anything? I, that's actually the most accurate one. Yeah, that's the most. Those are the most important ones. Yes. So thank you. Goodbye. See you next week. Kisses. Kisses. Kisses.